All right, welcome to the EW Podcast. This is Eric White, and today I am joined by Dr. Edward Watts, the chair of the history department at University of California, San Diego, and friend of the show, third time appearance. <laughs> Thanks so much, Eric. I'm so excited to be back. Yeah, me too. So um, you have a new book coming out. I think by the time this episode comes out, it will have been released. In, it's in August, August 3rd, I think it said, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay. So the book will be out by the time this is out. Um, the book is called The Eternal Decline and Fall of Rome, The History of a Dangerous Idea. What sets this book apart? What is the general point that you're trying to make with this one? I think the basic point that I'm trying to make is that when you talk about the decline of a society, it's actually an idea that seems like it's somewhat innocuous. It seems like it's kind of theoretical. It seems like you're talking about something that's abstract. But what you see in Roman history is that these ideas are really dangerous um, because these ideas that start out as things that are kind of abstract observations, they guide policy. Um, they become justifications to do things to other people that you otherwise would not be able to do. Um, and they become ways to create division in society so that you basically come to blame other people for causing problems in that society. And then you punish those people. Uh, and across Roman history, again and again and again, you see politicians who are opportunistic in the way they use this idea that Rome is declining to create division, to find people who they can blame for causing problems and then do things to those people that otherwise would not be possible. Um, things that extend to taking away their rights, taking away their property, taking away their lives. Um, and across Roman history, you see hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people dying because of this. Uh, you see wars started, you see invasions of entire countries start. Uh, you see all sorts of dangerous, damaging things that happen because politicians convinced people that Rome was in decline. Um, and is that where, so the, so, so, sorry to cut you off, but that's, yeah. is that where you, I mean, the eternal decline, you know, it's, it, it, you don't really think about Rome as eternally in decline, but that you use that in the title because uh, you say again and again, politicians throughout this period after the Republic fell, uh, used the, the idea of decline as a way to leverage their power. Yeah, this is actually something that we see across all of Roman history. So our first full length Latin language texts come around the turn of, you know, at the end of the third century BC, around 200 BC. And in the very first playwright um, who we have full texts from, he's making fun of this idea. So it's, it's there from the very beginning. You know, we see it at the very beginning of Latin literature. They're already making fun of people doing this. Um, and it continues, you know, through the Republic. The Republic falls in the first century BC. The Emperor Augustus uses it to justify creating his imperial regime. Um, the East and West divide in the fifth century. Uh, and in the sixth century, the Eastern Emperor Justinian uses the idea of Roman decline and fall to invade Italy and take it back for the Eastern Empire. Um, Charlemagne uses it as a justification for war against the Eastern Empire when he creates the Holy Roman Empire. Mussolini uses this idea um, to justify invading Ethiopia. Uh, and we see now politicians in the 21st century using this idea to justify policies of division uh, in countries as diverse as Spain and the United States. Um, and so that that's why it's eternal. You know, the idea is kind of there always. It's been there for 2,200 years. Um, and a lot of the time this idea is used, it's used as a weapon. Um, and it's used very cynically as a weapon. Um, but I think the other thing that's interesting is there are moments where these declines that are talked about are real. Um, you know, Rome obviously isn't here anymore. It did fall. It did decline. You know, it collapsed. But in Roman history, you also see people who use this idea differently, where they say that there's a, there's a social problem. Um, we're not going to cast blame. We're not going to ostracize people. Instead, what we're going to do is say that we can come together as a society to fix this problem. 
And so Roman history gives us lots and lots and lots of examples where the idea of Roman decline is used very badly for very bad reasons. But it gives us some examples where people use it for a good reason, you know, not to divide society, but to make it stronger um, and not to create problems that don't exist, but to respond to very real problems that need to be fixed. Um, and so looking at the idea as a kind of eternal idea that is there forever allows us to see when you can use it well and when you can use it badly. And what happens when you use it well um, and you make society stronger? And what happens when you use it badly and you make society um, divide and sort of fall in and collapse in on itself? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that kept occurring to me as I was reading it, um, I really enjoyed the book, by the way. I don't think I mentioned that. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it was great. Um, One of the things that kept occurring to me was uh, this, there's always a struggle between, it's like the conservative versus the liberal type of struggle where you have one group of people who want to maintain or go back to the way things were or not, or avoid change. And then there's this other force that's constantly trying to progress, you know, in a good society, those two kind of balance each other out and the steps that the liberals want to take are taken, but s- slowly and uh, ash- I don't know what the right term is, but carefully maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, so what you're saying in this book then is, you know, that is always going to happen, but when it leads to negative outcomes is whenever it's used as a weapon. Not that it's not that that force is there, but that how it's used and weaponized, right? Yeah, I think that's the key thing, right? I mean, societies change, bad things happen in every society. Um, a society needs to adapt to fix, you know, fix those problems or correct those deficiencies. And I think what Rome shows is when you identify a problem, um, and it might be a real problem, it might be a problem that you make up. Um, but when you identify a problem, there's two ways to approach this. One is to say you made you made these conditions happen, right? It's your fault that our society is going in this bad direction. And so you shouldn't be part of the solution or you shouldn't be part of the society at all. And in Rome, you see a lot of people take that step where they're using the identification of a social problem to kick people out of the city or arrest them or take their property away or execute them. Um, And the goal there is you know, I would say not always to solve the problem. In fact, most of the time it's not to solve the problem. It's just to have a justification to do something to someone else. But you also have moments um, where people in Rome identify a problem and say, look, I don't care who caused this, or maybe nobody caused this, but uh, I want to figure out how we can fix this. And so what can we all do collectively to fix it? And I think the um, person who does this best is the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, who um, is one of my favorites. Uh, And (laughs) and what you see with Marcus is Marcus goes through and he basically says, like, what are you capable of doing? I'm going to ask you to only do what you're capable of doing. And I'm going to praise you if you do it well. And if you don't do it well, well, we'll overlook that, you know. But the point is, we have a lot of problems we have to deal with. And collectively, we can solve them. We can make our society better. But we can only do that if we affirm what we do well. Um, it doesn't help anybody to say it's your fault that you did this, and so therefore you're not part of the solution. Um, it's much more advantageous to say, look, who cares how we got here? Let's move forward. Let's figure out how we can all make things better. And what can you do to add to the improvement of our society. Um, and, and Rome shows us both both the good way to respond to this in a way that brings society together and the bad way to respond to this in a way that divides society and uh, damages the integrity of the entire state and, and system and social order that you exist in. There's also uh, something, I mean, one of the things I found interesting about um, the book was the distinction between how people arrived at power, especially when it became an empire and the difference between, you know, if you had risen to power through treachery, you were more likely, it seemed to cast previous eras in a negative light. So as to justify or legitimize your treachery. Whereas if someone uh, came to power through more 
uh, honest means, it seemed like they were more willing to build upon what their predecessors had done and not use this uh, weaponized terminology. Can you talk a little bit about that distinction, please? Yeah, this is a really key thing that happens in the empire. Um, because in the Republic, where you have people running for election every year, it's a, actually a very good electoral strategy to say everything is bad and only I can fix it. Uh, and so in the Republic, this dynamic of everything is bad and elect me so I can fix it uh, really takes root because it's a very effective electoral strategy. Um, when you get to the empire, though, power changes much more infrequently. Um, and there are emperors who reign, you know, the Emperor Augustus reigns for 41 years uh, and he dies in his bed. And so when his successor takes over, he isn't capable of saying everything Augustus did is bad because he was chosen by Augustus. And for the last year of Augustus's life, uh, the Emperor Tiberius shared power with him. And so Tiberius cannot do what a Republican politician did, Republican Roman politician did, and say that everything is bad and I'm going to fix it. What he has to do is say, okay, everything is good and I'm going to continue it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so in the empire, the emperors who take power peacefully and succeed peacefully, um, their predecessor, these are emperors who emphasize continuity. And even if things are going badly, they don't say my predecessor caused this problem because the whole reason that emperor is in power uh, is because of that predecessor. So a great example of that is the emperor Hadrian, who inherits an absolute mess in the Roman Empire. Um, Rome has invaded what's now Iraq. The war is not going well, as a lot of wars in Iraq tend not to do. <laughs> and uh, and Hadrian has to withdraw and basically uh, acknowledge that Rome lost that war. Um, and he also is facing all sorts of other problems in the empire, but he peacefully succeeded the emperor Trajan. So he can't blame Trajan for any of this. Uh, so instead, what Hadrian does is he says, okay, there are problems and we're going to fix it. But Trajan is a god. <laughs> Uh, and that's the dynamic of imperial succession when it's peaceful. Um, when imperial succession is not peaceful, you have emperors do things where they create problems and blame their predecessors for causing them. Um, and so a, a good example of this is probably the emperor Domitian, who is killed in September of 96, uh, and is succeeded by the Emperor Nerva. And what you have is a whole bunch of people who worked under Domitian and did a good job working under Domitian, all of a sudden turn on Domitian and say, well, he did all of these terrible things. Uh, so that you can justify an act of violence that ended Domitian's life and brought about a non-peaceful transition. Uh, and so in, in the empire, you have a dynamic that is much more complicated than what you get in the Republic. Um, and it much more like that... sort of meaningful. Yeah, but it seems like that the that sort of um, the decline. L looking at the previous uh, uh, ruler as a negative force seems to be almost baked into our political system. I mean, you really only see um, some uh, a candidate for president, for example, talk positively about the previous. Uh, four years if he's running, if it's his re-election year. You know, you only yeah. see that sort of positivity. I, I, I. I can't think of a single politician who runs on things are good, but we'll, I'll make them better. You know, Barack Obama, change, Donald Trump, make America great again. Even, yep. you know, what, how does, how do you see that? And does that sort of dynamic feel baked into our system to you? And is that a negative thing? I think that in our system, you would see this. Um, we did see it with the election of George HW Bush. Um, where was, he took over for Reagan. Reagan. Yeah. 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 And so he took over for Reagan. And a lot of what he was pushing was a continuation of this. And he was able to pin Dukakis as somebody who was like out of step with the direction of society. Um, and so in a sense, uh, I think some people have said that what George H.W. Bush did was he won Reagan's third term. Uh, and so I think that you would see this like... Um, well, we've had complicated situations, you know, after Bill Clinton, Gore could not really run as the continuity of Clinton, even though maybe he should have and probably would have won if he did this. But the Lewinsky scandal and all of the kind of fatigue with Clinton meant he couldn't. And he ended up basically not having a message that, that would resonate in the way that H.W. Bush could. 
um, when he ran with Reagan. And then after Obama, if Biden had run, um, he could have run as more Obama. Uh, but of course, he didn't run. And the campaign was just very different from what uh, what we what we imagined, though, in an interesting way, when Biden ran in, in 2020, he ran as more Obama and not Trump. Yeah, so we kind of did both of them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think of someone like Bernie Sanders, you know, there, there are obviously real issues in our society, just as there were in Roman society that need to be addressed. Um, and, you know, I was a big Bernie fan. I, I, I love Bernie. I think he's uh, an honest broker, so it seems. But, you know, how do you view his level of rhetoric where, you know, he's does sort of vilify high earners, right? He's vilifying the 1% in a way. But it is a populist type of thing where he is, he seems to want the best for the greatest number of people. How can someone be a candidate, you know, and point out the changes without demonizing or finding someone to vilify? How, I mean, is there examples from Rome other than, you know, succeed, people succeeding their person who appointed them? Yeah, I think it's a really, really difficult thing. Um, so there are examples, like, for example, um, there's a man named Cacilius Metellus, who is a very honest politician, but he's an establishment politician. And at the end of the second century BC, he finds himself in a position where the establishment, the aristocratic establishment is undeniably corrupt. I mean, they have done a series of really terrible things, including basically bungling a war because they were taking bribes from the person they were fighting against. Um, he is not like that. Uh, but the the moment is one that's really pushing for radical reform. And the politician Marius, who uh, was actually originally associated with Cacilius Metellus, Marius runs as somebody who is going to be a radical reformer who's going to shake things up. And Metellus ends up on the wrong side of this. But Metellus's instincts were kind of good government um, honest, honesty in political behavior. And he was also, it seems, pretty uncomfortable with the way that uh, aristocrats had been behaving. But he was just out of step with the Roman mood because Romans were angry. You know, they, they felt like these people had been unaccountable. They had been clearly corrupt and nothing had happened to them. Um, my sense, uh, and I haven't followed all of Bernie's rhetoric all that closely, but my sense with Bernie is what what he's saying is not um, akin to what, say, some people on TikTok have been saying about Bezos, right? Like Bezos shouldn't have been allowed back from space because he's such <laughs> a terrible person. Um, yeah. th that, you know, that's different from what Bernie is saying. He's not saying, he's not saying like these people are so bad. That horrible things should happen to them. But doesn't but doesn't is, he doesn't his pointing out of that discrepancy sort of lead to that kind of sentiment? Like doesn't focusing on something like wealth inequality and pointing out, you know, the top tier people eventually lead to younger people or people who follow him to then make the correlation that this person is bad and then extrapolate that from there. Yeah, I think that that's where Bernie is careful. And again, I don't follow his rhetoric all that closely, but what I what I see in Bernie is somebody saying, here's a problem and we need to take policy solutions to address it. Right? The laws that govern taxation, the laws that govern um, the way that rich people's income and especially investment income is taxed versus salaries and regular people's income, these laws are not good. Uh, we need to do something that is more fair because it will make our society more fair. And that's what I have seen of Bernie's rhetoric. Um, that's not the sort of TikTok, let's launch Jeff Bezos into space and not let him come back. Um, it's instead, there is a problem in our society because there are legal structures that are not equal. And we need to fix this legislatively. There are legal ways to make things more equal. And I, you know, I followed Elizabeth Warren more closely than than Bernie, but this is what Warren had been saying: is there are ways to make our society more fair, and let's follow policy solutions that can make our society more fair. Um, and those policy solutions may not be what rich people want, though it's interesting that some of these things, even Warren Buffett 
is okay with. Um, but that is, but doing something that people don't want is different from saying these people are evil and bad things need to happen to them. And I don't think, at least in my experience, I haven't seen Bernie say anything like that, that no. these people are evil. I don't think he said anything like that either. Um, but I guess, like I said, my concern, not even a concern, just the thought of people who look up to him or listen to him, take what he says seriously, then pointing the blame and wanting bad things to happen to the people that he's pointed out as taking advantage of the system, right? Um, but. Yeah, and, and I think the responsible way to approach problems is to say that there's a problem and there are structures in our society that are causing this problem. And it's responsible of us as members of that society to try to fix those structures so that the problem can be addressed. Um, but what you're doing there is you're saying, this is a problem with our legal structure. It's a problem with our tax structure. Um, it's not a problem with people. And, and so then you have a way to solve it that is addressing, you know, a structural entity or a structural issue um, and not saying that these people are bad. Uh, and, and I think that that's a, actually, it's a really important thing because what you're doing there is looking to address the causes of the issue and make it so that in the future, that issue is not as much of a problem. Um, and, and that's a productive way to have a discussion. Uh, you can talk about the merits of tax policy or a wealth tax or um, any of these other things that have been bounced around. And that's a non-personalized discussion. It's instead something where you can use evidence and you can use economic theory and you can use all kinds of things to have a productive conversation about the best way to address a problem. But at, at no moment are you saying that um, somebody is evil, somebody needs to be punished, somebody needs to lose their rights. Um, and, and that's the step that we need to be really careful about. Because Rome shows that you're right. It is not very far from a policy discussion to a discussion of people. Um, and Romans frequently fall across that line where they go from talking about a policy to talking about evil people who are causing a problem. Um, and I think that's what I hope that we can we can avoid by looking at how Romans do this over and over again. Um, if you focus on the problem and the solution without personalizing it, you can have a better outcome as a society. Um, and that's what I hope we can see from Romans trying and failing to maintain that line over and over again. Yeah, I wonder if we're fighting against our very uh, animal instincts or our human nature at that point where, you know, I mean, it's just so natural to find an enemy or to pin, to try to put your, your failings or your uh, injuries to have some, to have someone specific be accused of that. Right. I mean, that's just a yeah. very human thing, but. Yeah. It's really yeah. hard to get mad at a tax policy. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot easier sure. to get mad at a person, um, yeah. and that's why it's that's why it's so hard to maintain that line. Um, but I think it's a very important line to try to maintain. Yeah, was there something? I mean, did the Trump administration or the, you know, I mean, the last five years of just kind of crazy divisiveness inspire you to write this? What was the motivation to to put your efforts behind this work? Yeah, that you're exactly right. That the last five years really did um, scare me, um, because you see, you see it around the world um, where a lot of societies that are facing really significant challenges. Uh, you know, I mean, everywhere from the United States to Turkey, you see these challenges. Um, there has been a push to personalize these things. You know, in the United States, I think we've gone from being able to have discussions about policy to the left attacking the right, the right attacking the left, and a, a almost dehumanizing of political opponents that, first of all, doesn't help solve problems. I mean, we're looking now at, at this moment, we're looking at the infrastructure bill, we're looking at COVID vaccinations, we're looking at all sorts of things where there are problems. And instead of being able to talk about productive ways to solve them, we're yelling at each other. Um, and we're blaming each other 
And we are taking our attention away from the problems we want to solve and focusing instead on other people who we are almost we're focusing on other people as the causes of the problems instead of bigger issues that we can solve. But when you're turning your attention to other people, um, you're taking them out of the conversation, you're targeting them, um, you're making them angry, you're making them uncomfortable, and you're making it harder to solve the problems you're actually looking to fix. Um, And you know, that's, it's happening all over. It's happening in many countries around the world. Uh, And so that really did prompt me to say, we actually have a frame of reference here. You know, we have a really long history where we can see this happen over and over again. Uh, We can see what happens when a society is in crisis or people perceive that it's in crisis. And they try to solve the problems in their society by targeting other people. We can see where that goes. Very rarely does it go in a good direction. Um, Very frequently, it leads to very bad outcomes for people. It leads to people um, losing protections that the society would normally afford them. And um, that shows the great danger in taking the kinds of rhetorical steps that we're taking. Well, I hope we can <laughs> pull back. It's <laughs> funny to me how the in the in, at the end of the book he provides some examples of uh, presidents. I think Reagan was a specific one brought up of using distorting Roman history to map it onto American uh, society or or progression. And he's basically using the very rhetoric of decline in the way that you are warning against in the book but focusing in on these specific events to make comparisons to modern American culture. And it's just, it was, that was really ironic to me that, uh, you know, I I think there's just a tendency to zoom in and pinpoint these specific things that went wrong with Rome and be like, this is why it fell and look what it's happening here. But really the issue is this great, this zoomed out sort of uh, tone that the politics takes on, right? Yeah, there's a um, one of my friends um, who taught for years at UC Santa Barbara has this great line where he says that uh, anytime something bothers you, this is Hal Drake, who's a, a great a great historian. Um, Hal Drake says that um, what has happened in the United States, in particular, in the last fifty years, but but going back even farther than that, is if something bothers you, all that you do is you say "fall of Rome because of X," and uh, and you look at the examples of this, and it's really um, it's really remarkable to see how many people do that. You know, they they say that Rome fell because everybody knows Rome fell. Um, Edward Gibbon's book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, has been in print for two hundred and fifty years because it's a good book. It's a really compelling book, uh, and so people know that Rome fell but they don't really know the nuances of that story. They don't really know when it fell. They don't know why it fell. They don't know that across history, you have hundreds of different moments that people pick when Rome fell. Uh, There isn't one moment that everybody agrees is the fall of Rome. Um, And a lot of those moments were invented to justify wars to try to take Rome back. Uh, And so we all know that Rome fell. We don't know much about why. And so what you see are a lot of people across, just even say the last 50 years, identifying something in American society or something in, in world, world development uh, and saying that Rome fell because of that. And so we need to be cautious about it. And some of the examples are ridiculous. Um, I mean, my favorite is uh, the dynasty actress, Joan Collins in the 1980s said that Rome fell um, because they all were covered in syphilis and then there was a volcano. (laughs) And it's just because it's the early eighties and she's concerned about libertine behavior and she doesn't know what she's talking about. I mean, syphilis comes from the new world and the volcano, I think she's probably trying to talk about Mount Vesuvius, but that happened in 81 BC or 81 AD. It didn't have anything to do with the actual fall of Rome, but she knew Rome fell, something bothered her. And so Rome fell because of what bothered her Uh, and the details didn't matter at all. Uh, And I think that this is, 
this is a really important way for us to think about how we consider decline and fall uh, because Rome stands out as the paradigm for the fall of a great society, the fall of a great civilization. Uh, and people who don't know anything about Roman history will still use the fall of Rome as a way to warn against something in contemporary society that they don't like. Uh, and so the last chapter I thought was a fun way, or not fun, but a, an interesting way to look at how people misuse this idea of Rome's fall to attack other things in their society around them that they don't like. Um, and the examples you get are all over the place. Um, you know, people blame gay marriage for the fall of Rome. Um, people blame, like Joan Collins, libertine behavior. Reagan blames uh, public education and people and men wearing cosmetics, um, which is, of course, interesting given Reagan's later life uh, as a person who appeared on TV with, you know, lots of makeup when he gave speeches to the, the nation. So there's all sorts of elements of this that are um, interesting. Uh, but very few of the modern evocations of the fall of Rome have much to do with what actually happened in Rome. Was there, did that, the, the, the men avoiding Roman military service and become dressing more feminine, did that actually happen? Was that a legit thing? Uh, I mean, not really. I think okay. that when you, when you look at the size of the Roman armies, um, there is a massive, massive growth in the Roman army size during the civil wars between Augustus and Mark Antony in particular um, in the first century BC. And then the army kind of shrinks down. But in the period that people are looking at when they're talking about the degeneration of the Roman state, um, a lot of people talk about this as occurring roughly in tandem with the embrace of Christianity. This is Edward Gibbon's idea, and it still remains kind of influential. Uh, that's just straight up wrong. I mean, the Roman army's size increases in the late third century into the fourth century. Um, a lot of the people serving are barbarians, but most of the people serving are Roman citizens. So what's different is in the Republic, especially in the Republic, uh, like in the Punic Wars, when Rome is fighting Hannibal, everybody is serving. Um, rich people, poor people, senators, aristocrats, everybody is serving. Um, but that's an emergency. And uh, as you move through the later Republic, uh, it's true that fewer aristocrats are serving long terms in the army. Uh, and you start getting, as you move into the empire, a kind of professional mil military class that by the third century and fourth century um, are basically hereditary. You know, you have fathers whose sons will then go into the army and the, the officer class in the army is something where um, positions of authority stay within, generally speaking, um, people from certain regions and people with certain family backgrounds. So that is somewhat different where uh, a senator in the fourth century AD and a senator in the fourth century BC are gonna have very different experiences in the military. Um, in the fourth century BC, they were serving, they were commanding, they were fighting. In the fourth century AD, they probably weren't. Um, and that is true. But in terms of the number of Romans who are under arms, there are more in the fourth century AD than there were in say the second century AD. Okay. Yeah, the reason I asked that is um, I, I, f I feel like there was a guest on Joe Rogan or something, but the last time we talked, I reached out to a friend and just asked if he had any anything he wanted me to ask you, anything interesting. And he's, he said uh, that he had heard from yeah Joe Rogan episode that Rome fell because of uh, an, an identity politics sort of crisis where people um, were claiming to be the the other gen or the other sex where it was males wanting to be female and then now after reading this book and you know he hearing how people pin various problems that are going on in certain society and map it onto roman the roman fall yeah that's probably hogwash huh yeah i've i've not heard that one um, okay but uh, i've not seen anything remotely <laughs> like that in ancient okay. sources um 
And and I think that the question then also becomes, when are we even talking about with the fall of Rome? Yeah. Um, if you were to ask, say, like a Florentine uh, scholar in the Renaissance, they would say, well, actually, the you know, the beginning of Rome's fall was the end of the Republic uh, in the first century BC. Um, and it, it hung on for a long time, but really the, you know, the decline that led to its fall started in the first century BC. If you were to ask Edward Gibbon writing in the 18th century, uh, Gibbon would say, actually the peak of Rome was 180 AD. Um, and that that's 200 years after supposedly Renaissance humanists would say that Rome started its decline. Uh, and if you were to ask, say, someone in Constantinople in like the year 1000, when was the peak of Rome? They might say the reign of the Emperor Justinian in the sixth century. Uh, and so you have various points where the fall of Rome um, for one person coincides with the peak of Rome for another person. Uh, and so the challenge in saying, well, this is what made Rome fall is what are we even talking about what fall of rome are you even referencing um you know the, the the actual end of the roman state happens in 1453 ad uh and so a state that starts in italy ends in constantinople in what's now turkey um and a state that starts basically in the bronze age ends with gunpowder and cannons um so it's a very very long time we're talking about uh and Throughout that very, very long time, you have all sorts of people saying Rome fell at this moment or because of this or, you know, um, in this particular context. And so when we're talking about the fall of Rome, we have to first start by saying, what fall of Rome are we describing? Uh, when did it happen? And um, why are we referencing that particular moment? Yeah. So there's this definition problem of, you know, yeah. What is decline even? What, what does it mean for decline to happen? And how do you, you know, how do you actually truthfully, objectively define a decline? You know, the, how, yeah. how, how, do, how do you define a decline? When do you, what do you see? I mean, obviously you see this, uh, raised temperature sort of, uh, violent rhetoric, uh, putting problems on a specific group as a part of the decline, right? Is that is that what you see as the major declining force or the force for decline rather in Rome? I think that the challenge we have as observers from, you know, basically visitors from a different time to the past. Um, when we visit the past, we bring our own ideas with us. And uh, when we think about the health of a society, we have our own ideas about what makes a society healthy. And we have our own ideas about what makes it, you know, decline. Um, so I'll give a great example of this because uh, it's, you know, first of all, one of my favorite things. But um, Isaac Asimov wrote this series of books called the Foundation Series. And Asimov describes, he came up with this idea of a galactic empire centered on a massive city uh, that he's going to trace its decline, but he's also going to trace the creation of a foundation that will preserve all of the technological and scientific knowledge of the empire uh, before its decline starts and before it falls. And his idea is there's someone who has created a mathematical formula to be able to see the future. And he sees that this way will prevent lots of suffering from humankind because it will preserve all of the great technology and skills that the empire has. And he measures uh, the, the baseline of before decline as being able to have atomic power for all of your electricity and being able to uh, participate readily in intergalactic, like interspatial travel where you can okay. move at the speed of light between planets. Um, and he's writing in the he's writing in about 1950. Right. And so this is the future, right? In 1950, progress represents atomic power and it represents ever increasing speed and capacity to travel into space. Um, the biggest rocket the United States ever launched into space was the Saturn V and it last launched, I think in 1973. Um, we reached the peak for atomic power generation also in the 1970s, right before Three Mile Island. 
Uh, and all of those things have been declining for the last 40, 40 to 50 years. Um, so by Asimov's measure in 1950, we are in a 50 year period of decline, right? In what, what he saw as progress in 1950, um, we have invested in other things. But Asimov also describes this uh, galactic empire from 10,000 years into the future as having paper newspapers, you know, as having really primitive computers. Um, what he envisioned as progress isn't the progress that we embraced. Uh, and so by Asimov's measure, we've been in decline for 50 years. Uh, by the measures that we chose, we invested in information technology. We invested in, um, you know, we created the internet. We invested in creating better computers. We invested in, you know, taking what would be an entire building of computing power in 1950 and putting it on our watch. Um, this is what we chose to do. And those are choices. And it's possible that 50 years from now, people will look at those choices and say, those were good choices. It's also possible that 50 years from now, people will say, wait, Asimov was right. You know, we did all of these things and we could have fixed climate change by making atomic power safe. We could have fixed uh, overpopulation by figuring out how to travel to other planets. Um, it's possible that the story people will tell in 2060 or 2070 is a story of decline where we made bad choices in like the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s that brought about a really terrible future for humanity. It's also possible that we would say, look, atomic power is not a great solution. Um, interspatial travel is not something we, fit, we are able to do. Uh, and so what we did is we embraced the technologies that we thought were best and they were best. Um, but I think this is the challenge that we have when we talk about decline. We're in the middle of it. And so we might be right in identifying problems in our society, uh, but we also might identify the wrong problems. Um, we also might embrace a future that isn't the right future. And it's hard for us to know what our story is going to be. It's hard for us to know what this moment is going to lead to. And this is why we have to be really cautious. There are things we can, of course, identify. Um, like saying, you know, bridges are collapsing. That's not good under any circumstances. We should fix them. Um, and I don't think anybody at any point in history would say, yeah, let the bridges collapse. That'll be better for us. Um, but there are other things where it's much more complicated to figure out what the big picture is, what the consequences of a long-term process of development um, will be. And what should we do in response? Uh, and I think the Asimov question is a key example of that. Who is right? Is Asimov right that the future he saw in 1950 actually is a good future? Or did we make the right choices in going in a different direction? Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely harder to see decline from within within the time that you're in. And I think there's another challenge of, you know, in the book you talk about how Rome started to lose territory. And to me, that seems like a pretty clear marker of a decline occurring, right? We don't, but we don't have such things happening in our world, you know? So there's these, that, that's a clear boundary shift of your territory. That's clearly not ideal for your civilization, but we don't have those types of things happening to us anymore, right? So it's hard, there's the measures of decline today are much more, di more difficult to assess than they might have been back then, right? I think that even the loss of territory is difficult to assess. Um, really? You Hadrian don't think that's a clear, a clear well, declining feature? So a feature when Hadrian decline. pulled out of Iraq, um, he made Rome stronger by doing that. Rome could not have held that territory. Instead, it just would have bled, um, you know, it, it just would have bled forever as long as it tried to hold that territory. And it might have lost it anyway. And so Hadrian's decision to pull out um, is a big, significant territorial loss, but it made Rome better. Um, the loss of, say, territory in what's now France in the 5th century AD did not make Rome stronger. It made Rome weaker. Uh, and so I think that just looking at the loss of territory isn't a good way of measuring whether the, the society is stronger or weaker. Um, 
but it can be a measure of that. You know, the, the loss of France was a real loss. The loss of what's now Tunisia was a real loss. Um, those are really consequential and they definitely made Rome weaker. Um, but the loss of, you know, the, the withdrawal from what's now Iraq in um, 117, that made Rome stronger. And so if you look at the lines on a map, that's a pretty significant contraction of the line, right? The line moved from the Persian Gulf basically back to what's now the center part of Syria, more or less. Um, that's huge. It's a lot of land to give up, but giving it up actually made Rome better. Um, the loss of France is a significant loss of territory and it did not make Rome better. Uh, and so again, we have to be really cautious about what we're talking about when we look at the loss of territory, because some territorial losses definitely are signs that the society is in danger, um, that it's weaker, that maybe it's even collapsing. Um, but in other cases, it might mean the society is strong enough to say, this is a bad decision. We can't hold this land and we need to move back. Um, and there are both examples in Roman history. Uh, like at one point, the frontier that Augustus tried to set in Germany was the Elbe, not the Rhine. And he realized there was a huge loss of, of large concentrations of Roman troops uh, across the Rhine. And Augustus realized like this land is not something that we can hold. Um, we're not going to be able to maintain this conquest and we're just going to pull back. Uh, and that was probably the right decision. Um, but again, when barbarians cross the Rhine and Rome loses France, that is very clearly not the right decision. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man, this is such a, you know, you, you, you would think that assessing the decline of something would be an easy task, but it's a really philosophical thing where you have to figure out what what actually made things worse could be a lot deeper than just looking at like something simple like territory, you know, it seems like it would be such an easy thing to just point and be like, you know, this was a declining feature of Rome. This was a declining feature of the U S but it's not so cut and dry. How do you personally assess the declines of Rome or the declining features of Rome? Like what, do, what are some markers to you that show it was declining? Uh, I think that one of the things that is really clear is um, when people in the society at that moment respond with panic, uh, you know, where they very clearly feel like something drastic has happened and it's not good. Um, and so an example of that is uh, when the city of Rome is sacked in 410. Um, it's sacked by the, the Gothic leader, uh, Alaric. And when Alaric sacks the city, he doesn't stay there. He doesn't conquer it. You know, he steals stuff. He takes prisoners and he leaves. But you see this, everybody in the Roman Empire, when they hear about this, realizes something different has happened. No barbarian has been in the city of Rome. Um, no barbarian has plundered the city of Rome in 800 years. Uh, and so when Alaric takes the city of Rome, it's not that the territory has contracted. Um, it's not that the city has been lost, but it just means that something very different has happened. Um, and it and people respond like this is a moment of really serious crisis where their society is not functioning like it should. Uh, and so that's a moment where like no line on a map really moves in 410. This is just a, a, a band of people that are moving through Roman territory, trying to get a space where they can live comfortably. Um, they're trying to get some kind of arrangement with the Roman state that means they're not going to be attacked. Uh, they sack Rome basically as part of the negotiations to do this. Um, but for Romans, this is a very clear sign that our society is in crisis like something bad has happened to us that hasn't happened for a long time and we need to reflect on why um and so i think these moments where you have people say what happened here is bad we need to figure out why it happened and we need to figure out what we can do to address it if we can address it at all those are the moments where i think we as historians should focus our attention um, because these are places where people feel that decline has happened in real time. Um, 
And what we might find when we look at this is actually, no, people are just saying these things, but they're trying to use it to attack other people. And there's not really a genuine sense that there's a problem here. Instead, there's just an identification of a, a means to cynically advance your own case or your own ideas or your own career. But we should at least look. We should at least figure out um, what they're talking about, why they're saying it, and whether this is actually a moment where we as historians should say, yeah, something is up here. It's not good. Uh, things have changed. They're really consequential changes. And we need to figure out what happened and why. Um, and that, to me, is the challenge I think we, we as individuals, should have as well. If people are talking a lot about decline, they're uncomfortable about something. Uh, and that's worth investigating. It's worth trying to understand why. It's worth trying to understand what's made them concerned. Um, and maybe if the society isn't in decline um, in an objective way using the metrics that these people might advance, but we need to pay attention to the fact that a lot of people are talking about it um, because there's something going on uh, and it's something worth trying to understand. So if I'm hearing you right, it starts with what the people of that society feel that that is more reflective or informative of a potential decline as opposed to specific actions, you know, of territory loss, for example, it's more so about how does that society feel? And I know we talked the first time about the rights of the individual, the rights of people, and that being a, a feature that shows the strength of the Republic, right? That the difference of uh, the empire and the Republic was those loss of rights. Um, so in today's world, you know, we have a lot of divisiveness, obviously, and a lot of people thinking that we're going the wrong way. Does that then indicate that we are in a decline because people feel that sort of uh, sentiment? Would you say that that's fair? I think it's worth considering. It's worth looking at it. Um, yeah. I think that one of the things that's particularly interesting is the rhetoric of decline can cause the decline itself. Uh, so, so to give, a good, give a good example of this, the date that everybody picks um, for 1,500 years that commentators and scholars and uh, intellectuals have chosen as the fall of the Roman Empire in the West is 476 AD. But in 476 AD, nobody knew that that happened. The, the moment that, that now has become you know, on mouse pads, on um, references in school textbooks, it was not recognized in 476 as the fall of Rome. Nobody thought that, not a single person. Um, what happened in the fifth century is uh, Rome actually got better after 476. The condition of the city and the condition of the Western state got better. But in the 510s and 520s, the East wanted to invade Italy and you had propagandists in the East saying Rome fell in 476 because that was when the last Italian Roman stopped being emperor in Italy. Um, but the fall of Rome in the West, that was this created idea. Um, one of my colleagues has called it a manufactured historical turning point. <laughs> um, that manufactured historical turning point actually led to what it described. It actually led to the end of the Western Roman state 50 years later and by a totally different group of people, but it caused the decline it talked about. And so one of the things I think we need to be aware of is when people start talking about decline, they might actually be creating conditions that could cause the very thing that they're afraid of. So people talking about uh, the decline of American society and the decline of a free American society might actually be creating conditions where somebody can use that idea of the decline of American freedom to take over the country and abolish elements of American freedom that we take very seriously. Um, and so the, the idea of decline might actually create the decline that it's describing. Uh, and Roman history shows examples where nothing happened at the moment you're talking about as a decline. Nobody thought that it was a decline at all when it happened, 
but it later will be used to justify something that creates the very thing that the people talking about decline um, complained about. Man, <laughs> that, that makes kind of <laughs> kind of tough, huh? To fix problems because you really, I mean, this goes back to the collaborative spirit that we alluded to before where, you know, you don't want to make someone the boogeyman, but you still have to address problems within the society. Um, yeah, it's a tough, tough line to straddle, I guess. It really takes yeah. awareness of, of what we're, what you're talking about in this book, really, of what can happen whenever you abandon that collaborative spirit and start othering, right? That's exactly. Exactly. I think what's really important is to say that, uh, you know, there, there are rules for how problems are solved. There are systems in place that provide procedures for talking about problems and coming up with those solutions. And those procedures are not perfect. In the United States, for sure, they're not perfect. But um, it is definitely more advisable to work collaboratively through those procedures than it is to say these people cannot be part of the conversation because they're just causing the problem. Um, once you other them, I mean, as you said, once you other them, you've now made this something where people are defensive. People, uh, I mean, defensive, not just rhetorically, but they actually feel like they're being attacked. And so they defend themselves. Um, it's very, very hard to get somebody who feels like they're being attacked to collaborate in a solution they're not 100% comfortable with. Uh, and I think that's the real danger, is if you start othering people, you exclude them from a process and you make it impossible really for them to participate in that process. Uh, and that doesn't lead to good solutions usually, but it also creates conditions that undermine the structures that society has long used to come up with productive solutions to problems. So it makes it harder to solve the problems that you actually are concerned about as well. Yeah. Well, I hope people read your book and uh, can become <laughs> more aware of this because it seems like uh, it doesn't seem like it's going to get much better. I mean, it's cooled down obviously in the last year with Biden taking the reins. The rhetoric has cooled a little bit, but not not as much as it needs to. I don't think. I think Biden has been really brilliant and deliberative in being as boring as possible, <laughs> right? Like, I think that that's actually a strategy to be boring. Um, and it it's a winning strategy at a moment like this, where I think people just, they, they want boring. They want to be able to focus on like the hippos from Pablo Escobar's zoo in Colombia. They they want to be able to focus on like a moose that walks into the middle of the road and you can watch it on YouTube. Like, I think we're done with the drama. And I think Biden gets that. I think that he understands that there's actually a real significant power in not being talked about, you know, in being kind of dull. Um because I think we want dull right now. We might not know it, but I think that's what we want is to focus on anything but Washington and politics. And um, that maybe is the way forward, at least for the <laughs> yeah. next four to eight years. Is Yeah, I mean, you know, if you just make it so you can't even talk about me because I'm so dull. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's uh, definitely reflected in, you know, numbers of viewers for. Uh, cable news, it's plummeting right now. CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, they're all losing their viewership at rapid rates. So I think that clearly demonstrates that people don't want, they're, they've had their fill, right, of that yeah. divisiveness. And that's that's perhaps encouraging. Yeah. And I think if this really is Biden's strategy, um, it's a really good one. Uh, if it really is strategic, um, I think it's brilliant. <laughs> and if he really is just dull, well, we're lucky. <laughs> yeah. For now. Yeah. <laughs> well, is there anything else you wanted to touch on from your book? Uh, anything we missed or anything that's coming to mind here as we wrap up? Um, no, I mean, I think that it's really important in moments of crisis to kind of strike the balance between being realistic and being naive. And, um, 
I'm hoping that what the book does is it allows us to see that decline is real. Societies do have problems. They really do struggle. Uh, sometimes they fail to meet those struggles. And as a historian and as a citizen, we need to be aware of the fact that there are real problems, um, but we also have to be really careful about how we address them. Um, and it may be naive to say at this moment in 2021 that we can take a step back. We can all uh, approach problems collaboratively. We can all just have reasonable discussions about issues and not people. Um, but I hope it's not naive. I, I hope we can do that. Um, I think we can solve our problems. I think that we can have reasoned discussions about what those problems actually are. Uh, and, and I'm hopeful that if we're at least aware of the need to do that, we can spend more time being open to each other, um, talking to each other, uh, thinking about thinking about the bigger issues that we all can agree need to be addressed and then having a reasonable discussion about how we address them. Uh, I hope to God that's not naive. Cool. Well, thanks, Dr. Watts. I really appreciate it. If you have nothing else to, to add, I think we'll wrap up. Um, Sounds good. Well, thank cool. you, Eric. This was a lot of fun and, yeah. and really, really good to talk. Cool. Yeah, I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, again, this is Dr. Edward Watts. His book is The Eternal Decline and Fall of Rome, The History of a Dangerous Idea. You can find a link to it in the notes. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time.